The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Initially dismissed as another example of Putinesque machismo, Russia's military intervention in Syria has altered the dynamics of an already complex situation. Yet Russian interests in the Middle East go well beyond preservation of the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad. It has concluded a four-way intelligence sharing agreement with Iraq, Iran, and Syria, sold billions of dollars in arms to Egypt, and is constructing or planning nuclear reactors in Jordan, Egypt, and Syria. On a strategic level, Moscow has long sought to project influence in the region. One foreign affairs article suggested that from Russia's point of view, the Middle East was a vacuum and a low-risk part of the world in which to expand influence. That piece was written nearly half a century ago in 1969. To help us explore why Vladimir Putin may be channeling his inner Catherine the Great in the Middle East, we're joined by John Kotska, who retired from the U.S. Foreign Service after conducting public diplomacy for the Department of State on four continents. His career included extensive service in Moscow. Also with us once again is Jeffrey Summers, Associate Professor of Political Economy at UW-Milwaukee and Senior Fellow at the Institute of World Affairs. He also serves as visiting faculty at the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. Well, welcome back, both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, uh, John, maybe uh, you can start us out with sort of a, a broad brush history of Russia's interests in the region. But before you do that, I'd like to uh, share one graphic. This is from Punch Magazine, November 30th of 1878. And uh, the gentleman in the middle is the ruler of Afghanistan. He is flanked by the Russian bear and the British lion, and he says, save me from my friends. So with that as a point of departure? Yes. Uh, there are so many ways in which we can look at Russia's influence in the uh, in, in, in interest in Syria right now. We can talk about it from the ISIS point of view, which was kind of the, uh, the uh, a, a easy lead-in for them. Uh, or we can talk about it from the U.S. interest, but I think the more fascinating is the Turkish-Russian connection. And all we have to do is go back to about 1753, uh, and, and we don't have to do this progressively by, <laughs> by the year, but 1750, in, the, in the 1750s, uh, Russia took control of the Crimea uh, with a sizable number of uh, Turkmen still there, and in fact, I, there are 200,000 of them still there today, which is a, a, an issue for, uh, for Turkey, as we, as, 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 even as we talk. But it, then Turkey fell on bad times. Uh, the Ottoman Empire fell. Uh, Russia didn't have par any particular uh, barrier to be able to expand itself, uh, to, to be able to get through the Bosporus out into the rest of the world through a southern flank. And uh, that brings us up more or less to today. Uh, a, a good point to make is that when I was back in Moscow in the early 90s, we were looking to Turkey to be, the, to be our surrogate in the Central Asia and looking for them to expand their interest. And they were not as enthusiastic about that process as we were. Uh, they later, they, uh, they now are more interested in becoming a regional power. So, Jeff, uh, let's fast forward a little bit to, uh, you know, say the the Nasser era in the in the Middle East and Russia or or the Soviet Union's role in that period. Sure, I, I, I am just going to um, regress though and reference that in the middle of the 18th century, uh, the Crimean Khanate. Uh, was essentially uh, engaged in the white slave trade. I mean, this is one oh, of the my. chief activities that <laughs> they were uh, indulging in. And over the course of a couple of centuries, uh, they grabbed uh, what historians estimate to be about two million people 
from what would be today Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, and even a few from as far north as the Baltic states. Wow. So this was one of the activities that the, the Russians were keen to bring uh, an end to. But uh, to bring us up to the 20th century, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully the end of the white slave trade, uh, we have, of course, with the Soviet Union, uh, this desire to expand uh, its influence, as you were saying, with Egypt in the 1950s. Uh, we see that uh, taking place with the Soviets providing the experts uh, that uh, were needed to, to build the Aswan Dam. And so the Soviets were uh, really beginning to project power in a serious way at this time. And of course, uh, with the successful completion of that uh, project, I mean, they became a, a contender with the United States uh, as one of the uh, chief principal uh, players in the region, especially as the former colonial powers began to uh, retreat as uh, influential actors in the region. You know, it's interesting about what he's pointing out uh, that doesn't fit the template we're working with today because Egypt is a Sunni nation and now the, the U.S. And, and Russia are lining up on opposite sides of the Sunni-Shia debate. Indeed. So uh, let's go forward a bit further to uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which put Moscow at odds with much of the Sunni world. Talk a little bit about echoes of that today. Yes, well, we have those echoes as well. Um, the, some of what we experienced when we went back into Afghanistan was some of the support we provided to those, uh, those dissident forces that came back to bite us uh, in, in through the ranks of the Taliban and through the Pakistan uh, ISI uh, that were not interested in uh, the outcome we were looking for in Afghanistan. Uh, the, I don't, uh, uh, the, the call for, for, for volunteers is what we're seeing with ISIS was what also happened in Afghanistan. Uh, we facilitated that and, and, and today we're trying to combat it. So I see there's, there's differences between them. Just to follow uh, John's rather uh, astute remarks regarding that situation, uh, we have to remember that Zbigniew Brzezinski, a figure who I generally hold in high regard, of course, uh, before 9-11 occurred in 2001, used to be uh, somewhat, uh, perhaps even boastful, uh, uncharacteristically, uh, arguably for himself, in his declarations of how much that activity was successful in terms of creating uh, a set of forces which would come to oppose the Soviet Union in the 1980s in Afghanistan, chiefly, of course, being the Mujahideen, and how that would help to bring the Soviet Union down and create a post-Soviet uh, world in which East Europe, thankfully, was freed from Soviet uh, influence and, and even rule. Now, of course, as we uh, uh, later discovered, and as uh, it came to be known, this uh, um, brought what was known as blowback uh, in the form of these radicalized elements who were not content just to liberate uh, Afghanistan from the Soviet Union, but who had a grander vision for creating a grander uh, Islamic uh, caliphate, and in which the United States was every bit as much of an enemy as was the Soviet Union or Russia. So that's what we are now contending with, unfortunately. Well, and it uh, illustrates the perils of viewing the world through a single lens, in this case, the Cold War. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryszynski also had a quote around that era in which someone was asking him the wisdom of arming the Mujahideen, and he said, what are a few stirred up Muslims compared <laughs> to the freedom of Europe? Indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> back, to your, back to your cartoon from Punch. <laughs> so, uh, Eventually, the, the Russians exit the scene from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, fast forward to Desert Storm, where you've got a, uh, a regime that was largely armed at that point by the Soviet Union, uh, coming to, uh, to blows with an American military. And how did the decisive military victory impact the, the perceptions of Russia, do you think, in the region at that point? I mean, was it, was it just a matter of, well, the Iraqis didn't know what to do with all those good Russian arms, or, or was it the sense that, well, we want to buy from these guys instead? 
Yes, that's an actually a very difficult question to answer because I think there's many different ways in which you can approach it. I th the, th obviously, the, when, when someone doesn't do well with, with your armaments, that doesn't look good. Uh, but then again, there is also uh, an appreciation within the region that some of these people were not as gifted with the, with the use of that machinery and that they obviously would be able to do a better job uh, it's, it's also, the, the question is, uh, what are the conditions that are laid down in terms of acquiring that kind of material? And Russia puts down far fewer of those conditions than we would, for example. Well, and we have a, a recent example of that in Egypt, for example, when, uh, when we suspended military sales uh, following the, the Morsi regime, and there was always another seller, and so in this case, that that really provided an opening to to Russia at that point, didn't it? Indeed. So, uh, talk a little bit about that period then, post Desert Storm, where you were actually serving in uh, in Moscow at the time. It was a, a diminution of influence and, and presence in the region, wasn't it, for Russia? Well, Russia was in disarray. Uh, and we were, we were running roughshod over Russian sensibilities. Their, their bureaucracy was collapsing. Their academic community was, was no longer funded and, and was in disarray. Uh, they were dispirited. There wasn't a leader who could speak uh, positively about where Russia was going. They were experimenting with market economics and, and uh, some democracy, uh, civil society uh, mechanisms. But as we saw through the decade of the 90s, that came to naught. And uh, the rise of Putin was what, what, what certain Rus uh, uh, some Russian watchers would say was the natural accumulation of a decade of chaos. And the Russians uh, absolutely abhor chaos and would prefer to have a strong man rather than no man. That would absolutely concur with John's remarks. I mean, you couldn't expect Russia to continue on as it had in the 1990s and to have uh, held this rather naive view that somehow you were going to just recreate uh, a, a liberal state in one's own image and to uh, somehow see that uh, emerge out of that chaotic situation that, that John is referencing. And in some senses, there are parallels between that situation and what we're seeing today. In other words, the United States had some role. It wasn't the only uh, reason uh, for Russia's collapse. I think most of those reasons were internal. But nonetheless, there was this sense that you could upend the Soviet Union and again expect a, a liberal state to uh, emerge from it. And we've had the same expectation uh, with Egypt. We've had the same expectation with Libya. And we seem to have the same expectations with Iraq and, and Syria if we get rid of Assad. And I don't think we can count on much better results. And we haven't given up on China yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's zero in on, uh, on the present and particularly the region uh, around Syria and Turkey and uh, look at some of the dynamics driving that situation from particularly the perspective of Moscow. But uh, first, we're going to take a short break. We'll see. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're talking about Russia in the Middle East with John Kotska and Jeffrey Summers. I'd like to read for you a, a quote from Alexei Pankin, who's deputy editor of Russia Insider, uh, regarding the role that the U.S. has played in the region. He says, interventionism, unilateralism, cultural blindness, and an affinity for regime change is how he would characterize U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. So. Jeff, talk a little bit about that. I mean, is, is that how U.S. policies in the region look from Moscow more typically? 
Well, I, I think it, it also began to look that way from the perspective of Milwaukee. <laughs> and if I, if I may say uh, 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 so, I'm referring, of course, to Milwaukee native George Kennan, who in the 1990s began to express his concerns over the direction that U.S. foreign policy took under President Bill Clinton, that it was becoming increasingly interventionist, that it was increasingly normative in its assumptions, it was uh, not looking at the realities that existed on the ground, and it was not, frankly, anchored in a history which would suggest that perhaps uh, the results would uh, not be good if one continued on this course. So I, 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 th I think there is a certain realism in, in Moscow these days, and I, I think that uh, that Realism is, for the most part, fairly shorn of ideology, uh, unlike, say, Soviet policy, and uh, it's uh, tethering to, to uh, a communism. So uh, I, 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 th I think there, there is much to that Moscow assessment of, of U.S. foreign policy, and especially the results that we've seen over the past uh, few years suggest that um, their assessment does have a good deal of legitimacy. Well, and John, that was uh, certainly one of Mr. Putin's justifications for intervening in Syria, that basically throughout the region you have this, this romantic notion of toppling governments you don't like and hoping you know, many flowers will bloom, and now it's up to Russia to come up and clean up the mess. Adding to what, what Jeff was saying, um, I, I, I saw this in, in kind of two, two elements. The first element was rather pragmatic. This is what we want to go in to do. Uh, this is who we do, need to displace. But once we get in there, the idealistic side of our, of our temperament comes in. And this is not just true today. This is, goes throughout our history. That we want to then go in and change where, wherever we are. I mean, we we're try, we, we tried it in, in Iraq. We're, we're still playing around in Afghanistan. Uh, we're willing to go almost anywhere to be able to try and, and insert our values into whatever country is involved. And it's that second part that I saw as the way in which we went into disarray. If we had limited, as we did in the first Gulf War, we had limited objectives. We did that, and then we got out. So uh, let's talk about those objectives on, on both sides. I mean, what, what is Washington's preferred outcome at this point in Syria? Well, I, I think that it has some contradictory uh, goals. And so on, on the one hand, it wants to see Assad removed from power. Uh, it rightly understands that to a certain extent, it's the presence of his Alawite uh, government that uh, prevents stability in the region, that there are Sunnis who have been abused by that government over the course of the past several decades, and that it's very difficult to find a stable situation with the existing uh, current order. Yet at the same time, they think that they can support uh, jihadist groups and somehow bring them to heel at some point in the future. And this does not seem to be uh, very uh, realistic. So I, I think the United States is uh, grappling with a, a set of contradictions for which it does not seem to have any good resolution for them. But and, at the, so at the, and at the same time, of course, they support uh, the Qataris and the Saudis, Sunni both, uh, who have this objective of displacing an Iran and Ira Iranian Russian uh, 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 axis with uh, Syria, based largely on an Iranian Shia uh, pipeline that would be run through Syria, and the Americans would like to see that. Uh, removed from the picture and to see the uh, Qataris put their pipeline as, as an alternative. So uh, that, that brings up the question of, of beyond just the ability to influence events in the region, what, what's in it for Russia in Syria? Um, energy. Energy. Uh, building the, the taking, it, uh, de uh, developing those de de deposits in Syria. Uh, uh, in a way, neutralizing uh, Azerbaijan's possibilities of coming in and, and supplanting uh, uh, 
Turkey's needs were from uh, from that direction, so they would have another uh, venue to come into to Turkey. Turkey gets 55 percent of its natural gas from Russia. Uh, in terms of how Turkey has to look at this issue, uh, that is a, a very dominant point that they have to be uh, const constantly aware of. So going forward, how indispensable or expendable is uh, Assad in this equation? Well, I think he's actually expendable for both parties. It's just a matter, a matter of how one does it yes. and uh, with what timetable. So I think even the Russians would be willing, as Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, has indicated uh, quietly to John Kerry, his counterpart in the United States, that uh, Assad can go, but it has to be done in a way which doesn't upend uh, the apple cart here. And so, I, I, and I think that there seems to be some mutual understanding between Kerry and Lavrov on, on this score, but there seem to be, and John can perhaps comment with more expertise on this matter than I can offer, but uh, it seems as though there are others in the State Department who have other agendas. Uh, how this is going to ultimately play out, I, I don't know. I don't know if that accommodation can be reached between Kerry and Lavrov and then be actually executed in policy. It seems as though, like the Catholic Church, the United States government right now has multiple centers and multiple centers of policy that are competing with each other. And that this, in part, is what is uh, generating some confusion and some inability to resolve the crisis. I think right now the, the dominant position in the State Department uh, on Russia is over Ukraine. Uh, and that's defining uh, how we react to them. And it's not like we're in the Middle East, we're talking about ISIS, and there's a new template. That, that Ukrainian condition applies to us. I'm not sure that the Europeans are feeling the same way about it, and I, certainly the, middle, the rest of the Middle East isn't. So th that's a difference. Well, and there is that connection for Russia as well, is there not? Is, is this not a way of... of taking that off the front page right. a bit. Absolutely. I mean, be, becoming the indispensable player in the Middle East takes some of the heat off you in, uh, in but Ukraine. Russia, Russia has, a sh has to take this on as a short-term uh, exercise because their, inf their internal issues are growing and the, and the need for infrastructure development, although we have that too, don't we? Uh, and their, their, the cost of maintaining the, their periphery uh, is rising. And, and the, that nest egg that they developed when oil was, was expensive is dwindling. Well, before we go, we certainly need to touch on one of the other uh, players we've, we've mentioned a few times here, but uh, Turkey and Turkish-Russian relations, punctuated most recently by the uh, downing of a, a Russian fighter jet. Talk a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, well, I think uh, Erdogan has uh, a, a number of agendas that he's pursuing. I mean, uh, on one level, he's quite concerned about the Kurdish populations within his own country forming an independent uh, secessionist movement with the Kurdish populations across the border in both Iraq and in Syria, so that's a great concern. Uh, there have been reports, I think they're credible, that the Turks are actually uh, taking a good bit of the oil that's coming out of uh, ISIS and that uh, some of that is actually being run or managed by members of his personal family. I think also that they would, as John was referencing actually before, uh, uh, um, a, a little bit indirectly, that they would much prefer to, to see a Qatari natural gas pipeline come through to Syria and then through Turkey to give them a hedge against Russian gas. Uh, and I, I think they want to also see uh, Russia split off from Europe and from NATO generally. And so this most recent stunt by shooting down a, a Russian Sukhoi-24 bomber uh, perhaps presented an opportunity from his perspective to do that, although it seems to have backfired. Uh, other that, European states are not very pleased with it. That's a aircraft, the backfire. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, the backfire bomber. Uh, but even the Americans are, are, even though they haven't expressed visible uh, uh, irritation with Erdogan, it's clear that they're not happy with him about this. The, uh, the shooting down of, the, of, the, of the, the jet and saying it was a territorial uh, uh, overshot, uh, I think it was just overblown. Uh, it really what we're talking about is those Russian bombers were bombing 
Turkmen positions mm -hmm. that were fighting Assad. And th that had more to do with this than, than the fact that they crossed this little nipple of a, of a territory that must have taken about 15 seconds to do. 17 to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got uh, under a minute left. Just sort of exit question: What should the U.S. approach be to, to Russia's involvement in Syria and more generally in the region? Well, I think ISIS presents us with the best opportunity to be able to bring together all these factors. We commonly agree that ISIS needs to be neutralized. I'm not sure you defeat it, but you neutralize it. I don't know what we do when we get past that, but in the meantime, that allows us to talk about, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia just was talking with a number of the, the resistance groups in, in Syria and coming up with a much more generous and inclusive kind of uh, agreement as to where they would be proceeding in terms of the Alawite government and, and the composition of the government. Hopefully what we might see out of all of this is a reset on relations between the European Union, the United States, and Russia. This is where everything really broke down, of course, was over Ukraine. And to my mind, the lack of some kind of tripartite negotiations between those three parties regarding how to handle the issue of Ukraine. So this cooperation uh, over Syria might provide a path forward for that cooperation with Ukraine and hopefully settling that rather unfortunate situation that has led to so much misery in Ukraine. Well, we'll have to leave it at that. Jeff Summers, John Kotzka, thank you very much to our viewers. We'll see you next time. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.